Okay, welcome aboard everyone to this week's live Path to Prosperity webinar. Uh, welcome to all the students in all five training programs, uh, investor agent, flipping for profits, rental profits, uh, turning rental problems into real estate profits, which is property management, and wholesaling, of course. Uh, welcome to all the, the um, silver members, gold members, and also the platinum mastermind members. So uh, we're gonna get started here. Uh, first things first, a little bit of housekeeping. Some of you are pretty new. Um, if this is your first time on, you'll notice that you're in mute mode by default, and that's by design. Uh, we can and will unmute you from time to time, so you can be vocal and everyone will hear you, <laughs> okay? So everyone from uh, California to Maine and Montreal to Miami, and even the Bahamas, okay? How about that? Um, but normally we use the question box, guys, for posting your questions, okay? So if you could do that, um, that would be wonderful. Um, any case, uh, uh, let's go ahead and, oh, we're sorry, real quick, one more thing. Um, when you when you post your questions, I'll respond to them, as, all of them before the night's over. The very next day, you're gonna get an email from Beverly, and it's gonna contain the recording of the webinar, as well as other instructions, um, you know, updates on the schedule, the upcoming webinars. Um, let's see what else. Uh, any updates to the, either of the platforms? See, there's three platforms you're on, okay? Uh, the training platform, where the training models are, the silver level member platform, and of course the um, um, pro, uh, community site, okay? So uh, look for updates to that and updates to content too. We're, we're always looking. Uh, we have lots of updates coming up this year. We'll post them to you. Uh, as they become published, okay? So, in any case, uh, schedule. I am in North Carolina this week. I will be in North Carolina next week, and I'll be in South Carolina the last two weeks of May, and of course, Georgia the entire month of June. Now, after a week off, um, I'll be, well, by the way, at the end of June, for those of you uh, who want to, we've got the next three-day event in Atlanta, Georgia, on June uh, 29th, 30th, and Sunday, July 1st, okay, for the for the mastermind members, we're going to be staying there and masterminding the next two days, which is going to be the 2nd and 3rd of July. We'll all leave July 3rd, Tuesday, so we can be home for July 4th, okay? Um, after that week, I'll be in Nashville for a week, the week of July 9th, followed by uh, Indiana the week of July, sorry, July, like July 9th or July 7th? Yeah, July 9th. July 16th, that week, I'll be in Indiana. Then I got another week off, and after that, the week of July 30th through August the 3rd, I'll be starting in New Jersey. I'll be in New Jersey for four weeks that week, um, and all the way into the week of July, sorry, August 24th, 25th, 26th, where we have another three-day event. So, uh, any case, uh, keep an eye on the schedule, keep an eye on the events calendar, and more importantly, uh, keep an eye on the email from Beverly. So. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into some content here. Uh, what I want to talk about tonight is um, easy, readily accessible sources of capital for you to use when it comes to investing. So if you're an investor, definitely take notes here. Um, this all come. This content is actually from the training pro program Flipping for Profits Without the Risk, okay? Uh, this is another way we reduce risk. Here. So when we, when we borrow against ourselves, we're going to have skin in the game. OK, we're more likely to stick out, stick it out during the rough seas and, and uh, rough seas are coming. OK, we don't know when we just know that they are. A lot of prognostic prognosticators are saying this year. I don't know if I knew. I believe me, I tell you. Um, all I know is I see it. I see the numbers. I know the numbers is definitely going to happen. OK, we've been predicting it since um, uh, early 2015, but officially since 2016. Uh, the challenge is, is we can't tell you exactly when, but in light of that, what you can do is prepare. So I'm not, so some of these things, it's funny, look risky to people, and it's only because of the, your mindset. You've been trained and, and taught um, to always be leveraged up to your eyeballs, borrow from other people as much as you can. The less money you have at stake, the less risk you have. Well, the challenge with that is a couple of things. Number one is, if you don't have any skin in the game, it's, it's human nature. How likely are you to stick with the program when when, when uh, seas get rough? And unfortunately, a lot of people say, to heck with this, they jump ship and let that ship crash into the shoals and more people get hurt. When people throw in the white flag, when people declare 
uh, properties going to foreclosure, and it's happened to some of us. I mean, not me personally, but I know on the webinar that's happened to. Um, you know, the challenge is when people will do it um, because they don't have skin in the game. What they don't realize is how much more damage it causes. I mean, it causes a lot of damage. The you know, banks are. It's not just like a, a nameless, faceless institution. A bank involves people. It involves investors into the bank too. People own stock at the bank, and they take a beating when this kind of stuff happens. So it's like a, you know the pain of one ends up becoming the pain for many. Not appreciate. I'm just what I'm getting at is this: is when you hash skin in the game, you're more likely to sit up and dig down deep inside and do what it takes to keep your ship afloat. Okay, um, that's the big reason. That's the most important reason, actually, because it's the one that's most likely to occur. The other thing is, is this. Uh, when you borrow from yourself, you actually have more control, all right, than when you borrow from other people with no skin in the game. If you don't have any of your assets leveraged or attached, okay, um, you, you're going to have less control. Uh, when you have some skin in the game, generally you get more, you know, better rates, better terms, better things like that, all right? So, uh Without further ado, I just want to preface that, and then now I'm going to kind of blow you all away by saying this. <laughs> when you're first starting out in the game of investing, it's expected to be leveraged, even highly leveraged, and I certainly was, okay? Um, I'm not now, but years ago, 32 and almost a half years ago, believe me, I was leveraged up to my eyeballs, okay? Um, and I stayed that way for about 30, my gosh, 30, 30 years in debt like that, okay? I mean, we're talking millions of dollars, guys, okay? Um, and once I learned that, you know, I was in a position, so I borrowed for all those years. Early on, borrowed a lot more. As time went on, I borrowed less and less and less on a percentage basis, which gave me more and more control. It also uh, freed up other paths to leverage the assets I had to get access to more money, to more cash. So I was able to shift from borrowing completely to get into a property to eventually be on the property under control without any lien on the property. I, didn't, I, I may have borrowed, but I didn't have to borrow uh, to get into the property. I've got the property because I borrowed against I leverage my other assets. Get the property secured and then later on borrow strategically against the asset. Okay. Um, huge, huge difference, right? So in any case, what I'm going to do is show you some of the things that, that, are good ways to borrow that allow you to have some skin in the game and allow you to have more control, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and jump into it. I just want to paint that picture for you. So you had a lot of people have some, unfortunately we hear some things and not others. And <laughs> um, I just want you to have the, the big picture there, okay? Um, a lot of this, if, if any of you don't have this, if you're in a, if you let's say you're in one of the rental programs and you don't have the uh, flipping program, some of this you can get from the book Flipping for profits without the risk. If you're if you're at least a silver level member, just go to the silver level members area of my investor services. Log in silver level. You go into members area first, then log into silver level. Left hand side, scroll down to where it says Premier eBooks, and you have access to all five of them there for free. Okay, if you're silver or above, so you can get that there. If you're really interested in the program, just call, text, email, whatever. And if you're far enough along in the program you're in. We can uh, reasonably discuss this program or any other. Um, we just don't want you too, doing too many things at once, okay? So back to this. Um, um, you've heard me say it. Other, you've heard other people say, excuse me, never use your money. We just talked about that. Um, I can promise you everybody has used other people's money, including me. But a lot of the pros actually use their own money and their own assets, okay? Um, so let's go ahead and jump into it. Number one is it's very easy to do it's your in in the states we call it a, a 401k um in canada you to we use a different term up there but you have the same you can also borrow from your retirement funds for if you're a canadian okay um so let's just stick to one we'll describe one and it'll you know basically the principles apply to the other so 401k in most cases with most employers can be borrowed against when you're actively employed, okay? And there's a distinction there, which is if you're not actively employed, most employers will not let you borrow against the 401k. So let's say you work for, you know, Rogers Communications up in Ontario or AT&T in the States. Um, 
while you're actively employed, you can borrow against, in the case of AT&T, the, that company-sponsored 401k plan. You can borrow against that typically up to 50% of the value of the fund. So if you have, and there's usually a maximum, by the way, ceiling. So if your plan has a balance of $200,000 in it, they will typically allow you to borrow up to 100000 Get really good interest rates, rates that are generally a little bit lower than prevailing rates in the marketplace. Okay. All right. That's good news, number one. Good news, number two, is it's usually very affordable to borrow that money. It doesn't cost a lot. Sometimes there's like a simple, you know, $250 administrative fee. Okay. Um, you fill out a form and application and all that. And the other thing, too, is the interest that you pay back is paid back to you. That's your, that's your money. You're paying yourself back. Now, a little caveat here. Check this out. Back until um, I think it was uh, probably the late 80s, when you borrowed against the 401k and you paid it back, not only was the interest paid back to you, it was also tax deductible. Imagine that today. They, they shut that loophole down pretty quickly. I think uh, it came out as a result of the Tax Reform Act of 86. We had a, a crash in 87. And because of the Tax Reform Act, a lot of properties went on the market. You know, high wage earners like self-employed people like surgeons lost a lot of loopholes, created a huge opportunity. Just like I've always said, wherever there's adversity, there's opportunity. You just have to, you know, open up your eyes and be aware and be awake and be alert and look for it. So nowadays you can't write that interest off. You can pay yourself back, which is a huge benefit, particularly. Let's, so let's say right now the market's up. OK, and we predict the market's going to drop. It's, it's going to happen. So while the market's up and it's teetering like that, it might be a good time to borrow against your 401k when it has high value. And then as it's dropping, the good news is you pull that money out, you're purchasing income producing asset like a, like a five unit building like Pam and, and Daryl, okay? Um, that's generating a lot more revenue and you're still paying yourself back a, a nominal rate of return, okay, in the form of the interest rate. So in any case, that's really, it's really that simple. I mean, the application's sometimes a little bit lengthy, They'll ask you what are you using the funds for, okay? It doesn't mean they're going to prevent you from borrowing. It's your money, okay? They just want to document it. They want to see why are people borrowing the money. Um, so 401k is a great, great way uh, to leverage assets that you already have that allows you to have skin in the game. I know it's. It, I know some of you are thinking, boy, that's risky. That's my hard-earned money. I want to keep it in there. Uh, but the fact is, if you're strategic about it, um, you know, if, and you borrow, if and when you, the market's at its peak and you borrow then, chances are you're going to be okay. And you would never buy a property without going through due diligence. Remember, real estate is a far more forgiving um, investment than the stock market, okay, historically speaking. And the stock market, you've got, you know, a couple of moves, get in, get out. And there's other things you can do that are very risky. But the point is, with real estate, you have more control over the asset. Um you don't have to sell it if you don't if you don't want to or need to, even if the market drops and the value goes down. As long as you keep it and you're renting it out, okay, your 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 assets intact and it's okay, and hopefully it's producing some income for you. So in any case, a um, uh, great way to borrow. Now we're talking about IRAs and things like that a little bit later. Um, I just want to go over the 401k first because most of you um, have spouses who are employees or you're still an employee yourself. Okay, now. Uh, IRA, we kind of touched on that a second ago. Um, define, you, you have uh, retirement plans in a, in a number of different ways, different shapes and sizes and uh, definitions, okay? Um, in the world of IRAs, um, you can take money from another investment vehicle, okay, and roll it into what's called a self-directed IRA, all right? You can actually, there's a number, you can roll from another IRA uh, that's not self-directed into this one. There's certain guidelines you have to follow. And there are companies that do this, will help you, guide you through the process. You all know the two that I recommend are CAMA, all right, um, C-A-M-A. And you can see um, uh, Carl Fisher runs that company, by the way. He's, uh, I've known him for years, probably, my gosh, 15, 16 years. Um, when I spoke at the annual re-event this year, he was also a speaker there at the same event. Um, and everybody I've ever known that worked with him, I've never, ever, ever heard a single complaint. Uh, the other company is Equity Trust, much, much bigger. They're based out of Ohio, um, but they do business just like Carl in most of the states, okay? Um, they'll have, we'll have different companies in, uh, up in Canada. 
Um, but in any case, uh, Equity Trust, I, I know some of those guys too personally, right? I, I know the, the president, uh, some of the vice presidents in charge of marketing and things like that. And I've also spoken with them. Uh, they have a big annual event every year also. So in any case, um, what you do is you roll your money into a self-directed IRA and you want to use one of these companies to guide you through the process. They will help you in the management of the process, which is extremely critical. Okay. Um, the reason is if you make one false step, um, your house of cards could come crumbling down. In other words, you lose the benefits of investing from within a self-directed IRA, which are some are quite profound. Okay. So let's just, let's just break this down. Um, when you buy a property from inside of an IRA, okay, let's say you buy an asset and you buy it for $100,000, okay, and then you remodel it for fifty, dollars and you sell it for two hundred. dollars You just had a gain of $50,000. Well, that gain is sheltered. It's inside the IRA. You don't pay any tax, taxes on that gain. You, an IRA, remember, you still only pay when you withdraw your funds. You pay taxes as you draw the money out. So you can grow your asset base inside the IRA to, I mean, infinity, okay? So in any case, that's the good news, all right? Uh, let's, uh, by the way, let's say, uh, let's say you're buying a rental property inside an IRA. This is kind of important, guys. You definitely want to write this down. One of the rules is, uh, well, let's first talk about the benefits. Um, the appreciation of the property, again, uh, that growth, is uh, sheltered. You don't have to pay taxes on that growth while it's in the IRA. It grows tax-free. Um, also, the income that that property generates in the form of uh, cash flow from your rents. Same thing. It stays long as you keep it in there. It stays in there. No taxes on that. Okay. Um, now, that's some of the good news. Some of the downside is this: um, the rules stipulate that you, the owner of the IRA, cannot actively participate in the management in the maintenance and upkeep of the property, okay? Um, and that, and they're serious about that. I mean, that includes even writing checks and everything, okay? So you have to pay someone else to manage your asset for you. And you, that costs money, it's gonna be an expense for you. Um, and that doesn't mean the property manager fee that you pay and, and the leasing fees and things like that, that means the, a manager, like a custodian, you gotta pay that person to act on your behalf, okay? Or that company. Now, one of the things you can do, and first off, quote unquote, I'm not an attorney, okay? Um, but let's say you do have your own property management company, or you do manage your own properties. You've got your own team. You've got a you've got somebody that works for you showing properties. You've got someone working for you to do maintenance and repairs, so forth and so on. Um, you can set up a separate company like an LLC, which is exactly what I did, okay? Um, you know. Win Rental Management, comma, LLC, that the IRA can pay to manage your properties, all right? And you can take, you can make it 10%, for example. So in theory, in essence, you can actually pay yourself a management fee, okay? I recommend do it through an LLC. You want to always separate yourself from the function. You want to separate yourself from the liability, separate your personal self from the management function. The management function should always be in its own separate LLC, even separate from the properties. Okay. So real quick, just put that on the shelf for a second. IRA discussion on the shelf. Speaking of properties in and of themselves, just say they're not in an IRA. You always want to have those properties in an LLC. What I was saying a moment ago is the LLC that owns the properties should not be the same LLC that manages the properties. Okay. Different LLC, different risk, different, different liabilities. Um, and you shelter your assets more, more completely by doing that. Okay. Now let's step back into the discussion of IRAs. So what I'm getting at is, is, uh, investing in real estate within a self-directed IRA can be a little bit costly. There's some setup fees, things like that. It just, then it takes some time, energy and money to get that set up. But long-term, if you can imagine the tremendous benefits, okay, of not having to pay taxes, on your gains while they're growing, while the assets are growing with inside the IRA, tremendous, tremendous value. So for those of you who are extremely strongly interested in this, um, look in the Silver Level membership area, go to the recorded webinars, okay? Hey, let's just do that. Let's go ahead and do that now. And I'll show you exactly where this is. 
is I'm going to give you the, the special webinar we did on this last July. Um, so click on members area, click on silver level. Okay. Uh, log in. That's me. Or try to remember me and log in. So I'm in the members area. I'm in, in silver level. I'm going to go down to where it says weekly Q&A webinars. Okay. Weekly Q&A webinars. Click on that. Okay. And I'm going to scroll down. Let's see. 2017. I'm pretty sure it was last July. So let's go. Uh, last July 717. Here it is. So look for this recorded webinar, guys. 2017-7-10. That's the date, which was July 10th, 2017. Subject, guest speaker Carl Fisher discusses self-directed IRAs. There you have it. You got a, 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 a slideshow in there you can follow with information, contact information, uh, instructions, facts, figures. It's all right there, guys, and you can download this and keep it forever. The way we operate, for those of you who are new, is anytime you get one of these, you can download this thing. It's yours to keep forever. You actually can build your own library, so <laughs> keep that in mind. Okay, so let's go back to where we were. Um, Self-directed diaries, awesome, awesome way um, to grow a portfolio and reap the tremendous benefits of uh, deferring all those tax, the, excuse me, the, uh, the tax burden on the gains. Um, remember, when you're in an IRA, when you withdraw the funds, let's say you're in a whatever 15% tax bracket, you're only going to pay taxes based on your 15% tax bracket and only on the funds you take out. When you're 70 and a half, there's what's called a must withdrawal age. You must begin withdrawing funds no later than the year you turn 70 and a half. Okay. It's just one of the rules with an IRA, but they have minimum, minimum amounts, minimum requirements. Um, now the good thing is for all of you guys is when I was in banking, one of the one of the businesses I managed was the IRA business. Okay, um, that's been a while, but some of the rules are still the same. Um, on the front end of that, by the way, you have what's called a can withdrawal age, which is 59 and a half. You can begin withdrawing when you're 59 and a half. Um, you always want to look at your financial position and see what makes gives you the greatest benefit as far as use of funds and, and tax burdens. Okay. For some of you, 59 and a half, you want to start withdrawing your funds to stretch out the withdrawals over a longer period of time and hopefully reduce your, your tax burden. Some of you, you just want to keep it growing in there as long as you possibly can and don't touch it until you're seven and a half. Then you got to start taking some money out. Okay. Um, in any case, I think I give you enough there on IRAs. The main thing is remember uh, uh, Equity Trust and CAMA, which is Carl Fisher, and you've got his contact information on that recorded webinar. So, um, in any case, uh, let's move on to the next possibility, which is a whole life policy. Uh, I learned this, by the way, from some of my most very most affluent clients. OK. Um, in my younger days, when I was building my portfolio, um, of course, I was not affluent. I started off like a lot of people, basically nothing. OK. Um, when I graduated college and I, I went to college because I was able to get some grants some loans and my, my, my poor mom contributed whatever she could on a basically a weekly basis. And my dad had contributed also to a small degree. Um, but at the end of the day, when I graduated guys, I graduated with a little bit of debt. I had a degree and I had a, a 13 year old car and a, and a $75 um, congratulations gift for my dad. Okay. And a watch for my mom. <laughs> that was it. All right. So, when I looked into life insurance, I looked into all the, the, the ways to do it, you know, whole life, um, you know, term life, um, you know, and I, I forget what the other one was. The other one is actually, unfortunately, got, got um, talked into buying it. I can't remember what that kid was called. It's like, a, it's like a hybrid approach, but they called it something else. In any case, um, so people in, in, who were like in my bracket back then generally – we're being advised by non-insurance people like financial planners who were not in the insurance to not buy whole life policies because they're just weren't a good investment. Okay. You can get the same death benefit from a term life policy. That's a lot cheaper. So that's what I did term life. Turns out as I became more affluent, I was hanging around more affluent people. Okay. Remember the old saying, if you want to be rich, you got to hang around rich people, which is why we really like the mastermind group because we all are either already there or we're, we're working to get there. We want to hang around other people who are getting there also. 
But in any case, um, what I discovered was those who were affluent actually did have whole aid policies. Okay, and they they had, had different. Um, their motivations were different than people who were not affluent. Okay, their motivations were such that a whole life policy gave them some abilities to um, to leverage, like they can leverage the value of the whole life policy, the cash value. They could they could borrow it, they could take it out, actually withdraw it. Okay, and use that um, to buy other assets, like income producing assets, like real estate, which is what they do. And they still maintain the death benefit. Now, the reason they had these policies, and some of them were quite large. I mean, we're talking tens of millions of dollars. The reason is it was a it was a form, a very low risk form of asset protection for them. So uh, let's say they owned a business. Like a lot of wealthy people are wealthy, not just because they are real estate guys, but because they also build businesses. In fact, you've heard me talk about this a lot. Real estate investing is not the end game. It's the platform upon which you launch other businesses. The real wealth comes from the businesses, which by the way, you can translate back into buying bigger, bigger properties. So the cycle is you start off where you start off, duplexes, triplexes, leverage, you're in debt, I get it. Keep going, keep going, keep going. You can start to leverage your, your growth and your equity and your portfolio to switch from borrowing to get into it, properties to borrowing against the asset once you've acquired the asset, and eventually get to the point where you've got a real solid platform where you can launch other businesses. All the income from those other businesses allows you to buy bigger and bigger properties, bigger commercial properties. Okay, now back to this. Um, when you have big businesses, a lot of these people, and I'm not saying they're, they're um, you know, they, they're the CEO or the founder of AT&T, they're entrepreneurs just like us. Okay, I, I've owned, I've built now seven businesses over the years. Um, and, it, you know, I've, at the point right now, I'm like probably in the top 1%. But there's a lot of people in the top 1%. I'm not worth the $100 million. I'm doing pretty good, but I'm not worth the $100 million. Some of these people were. Um, what I'm getting at is, let's say that person built that business from, from the ground up over the years. And I've seen this happen, okay? And that person dies. And all of a sudden, the family's left with the family business. So yet nobody knows how to actually run the business. They've been working in the business. But there's a difference between working in the business in working on the business, okay? The owner is the person who built it from the ground up. They're the ones that, that see things from an owner's perspective, okay? That's different from a manager's perspective. I've seen managers do things like break away from companies to build their own company only to fail because they only had the manager's perspective. They didn't have the owner's perspective and they didn't realize what it actually takes to build and run a business. I mean, you put everything on the line. What I'm getting at is this, if and when, the end of the day comes for this owner, the builder, and that family's left there wondering what to do. Um, and that business, by the way, one of two things usually happens, most cases, um, it drops dramatically in value, right? Because the guy who built us no longer there. So anybody that comes in to want to buy, let's say the family says, well, we're going to sell. It's got to be worth $100 million. Well, guess what? Nobody's going to buy that thing for $100 million bucks if the guy who built us no longer there, Okay. They might offer you 50%, $50 million, for example. The whole life policy protects the family by giving them the death benefit of, say, 50 million bucks, okay? Let's say the worst case scenario happens. The family decides we're not going to sell it. This thing is a gold mine. Grandpa built it, and we're going to run this thing. You only, you always read books about this, and you read the good stories. What you don't read is the stuff and all the things where it didn't work out, okay? So let's say the family does that, and the thing folds in a couple of years. And I've seen that happen. I saw this happen with a meat packing company in California. Thank goodness uh, the, the, uh, the son passed away, um, who actually ran the thing, built the thing. Um, he put his family on the board, and his wife, they didn't like her. They, she was estranged, but she was on the board. And um, they finally had to give in to her, and she just finally decided to um, turn the meat packing company into an organic meat packing company, something nobody was doing at the time, which she foresaw this people wanting to be eating healthier food. She's from Canada, by the way. Um, and she was a um, um, pageant, beauty pageant winner. Uh, in any case, um, she did that and built the company back up to half a billion dollars, $500 million. If it wasn't for that, that company was on the brink of disaster. They literally were folding, right? What I'm getting at is this. Let's say that doesn't happen and the company folds and, they, and the heirs have nothing. It's wiped out. This whole life policy will protect them, will protect, will protect the wealth 
uh, of the family. That that's why they do it. The main reason. The second reason again is um, they can they can actually withdraw the cash value of those of the whole life policy and invest it to buy more income producing assets. In any case, <laughs> I hope that helps you with uh, understand why why would you have a whole life policy and who actually does have them and how they use them. If you have a whole life policy, you want to look into this, just call your administrator. It's going to be right on your policy. Just call them up, hit the right option on the phone, and they'll get you to the right department, and they will send you their instructions, and you can read all about it. Not a very complex thing to do, okay? Okay, uh, let's talk about private partnerships. I think I had, uh, yeah, 401k, whole life, whole life, right, IRA. Uh, all right, here it is, private partnerships. Um, I've been in a couple of partnerships over the years, okay? And I do recommend them in certain circumstances. Now, the thing is, is every situation is different. And everybody always says, you know, hey, this is easy. This is my brother. This is my spouse. This is my best friend. We've known each other since the first grade. We're going to form a partnership and invest in real estate. That's great. I'm, I'm all for that. Okay. The challenge is, is that as soon as I say you need to see an attorney to draw up a very uh, thorough operating agreement for your partnership. Okay. You generally set up an LLC, you form it as if it's a partnership because it is a partnership and you can, you know, you can make LLCs look like anything you want. We talked about that. I think last week, is that right? Yeah, I think we did. Um, in any case, uh, when it comes to partnerships, the, the main thing you want to focus on, which is hard to do is the back end when you're going to dissolve the partnership. In other words, you're going to sell the asset or you're going to, you know, whatever things happen. You know, what's, what's interesting is it's always a lot of fun getting into a partnership. Everybody's happy. Everybody's excited. We're going to make a ton of money. Okay. The challenge is, is that life happens. People get married, people get divorced, people born, people die, people lose jobs, people become incapacitated, people get sued, people declare bankruptcy, people declare foreclosure, all kinds of things happen. When they happen, what happens is you're often making decisions in haste, okay? You're in, a, in, a, in, a, you're in distress, you're in crisis mode, and you're trying to make decisions then. One of the beautiful things about a properly written operating agreement is you have all those decisions points uh, pre-agreed upon, agreed upon when you're not in a state of crisis, when everybody's happy, everybody's feeling good, you say, okay, what happens if one of us uh, gets divorced? What happens if one of us dies? What's ha what happens if, if one of us gets sued? Whatever. Um, you want to document what happens in those circumstances, what we call the exit strategy. So somebody wants to sell their portion. What happens when that person wants to sell their portion for any reason? What I'm getting at is, is partnerships can be a wonderful thing. Um, any partnership, you don't have to, both of you contribute the same amount of money. You can contribute different amounts of money, different amounts of money, excuse me. In fact, I just had a strategy call on this this week uh, with Kate, all right? Kate Crowell from Wisconsin. Hi, Kate. Hope you're on the webinar tonight. I think I saw your name. Um, in any case, uh, so we talked about how do you determine the compensation model in a partnership? If it's 50-50, you put in 50% of the money, your partner puts in 50% of the money, and you're both uh, providing the same level of sweat equity, your same time and energy, obviously the split's 50-50. I've seen other partnerships where one person is providing all the money, and that person is providing all the sweat equity, and again, 50-50 partnership. Sounds real simple. The challenge is sometimes it's not that simple. Sometimes they're putting in 70, you're putting in 30. They're putting in no effort, no time, no energy. You're putting in all your effort, all your energy. In those situations, you would have two parts of your compensation model. This is really important, guys, if you can please write this down. You have the investment side of the split. In other words, if you both put money into the partnership, but at different percentages, okay, a portion of the profit um, should be, or any capital gain or any profit thereof, uh, should be split on a 70-30 basis. Now, what we haven't accounted for yet is your compensation for your sweat equity. You're also putting in your own time and energy, which is worth money too. Um, in fact, the more you do this, the more you'll value your time. You know, years ago, I would charge, you know, 100 bucks an hour. Now I charge 1,000 an hour. I don't even blink an eye when I ask it. Matter of fact, I should charge more because I actually make more than that. But I, 
different story for a different day. Back to this. Um, your time is valuable. You are valuable. You're a worthy person. You deserve to be compensated um, in addition to the profit split. Okay. So what you do is in your operating agreement, you define the role that you're going to play, project manager, whatever you want to call it, and what your compensation should be either in the form of salary or a portion of profit. That portion of profit is set aside before the remaining profit is split based on your investment split. That's what I was driving at. So if you are providing sweat equity and the other person is not, you first pay yourself for that in the form of a salary or a portion of profit before the other profit is split between the two of you for the investment side of the game. That's the most important thing you want to remember there. Okay. It comes out before everything else is split. Okay. Um, and you can do it. You can get very creative with this. You can say, I'll take a salary plus a portion of profit for me, for my compensation for my sweat equity. And I'm still going to split the other, the remainder of the, of the profit with you, Mr. Investor uh, on a 70, 30 split because you put in 70, I put in 30. In any case, I want to stop real quick here and ask for questions because everything I gave you so far, 401k, IRA, whole life policy, pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, but what I just gave you here is actually a little bit more advanced. So let me just check for questions and make sure we're caught up here. Um, okay, now what's interesting is that, um, oh, that's the beginning. Hang on, let me scroll down here, guys, um, and make sure we're okay. Let's see. Hi, Gift. Good to, hey, Gift, did you get, uh, I resent you a text with the time trade link, the correct one. I don't know why I just goofed on the first one. So you have the correct one. Um, also, um, if there's ever anything urgent, guys, remember to, to text me. If something really urgent, if it's just a discussion, please use the time trade link. Um, but if you're in the middle of negotiating, uh, like a listing or a contract like Pam or Daryl were, Actually, they, used, they actually used their time trade to do that. Uh, Daryl was more urgent. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, back to this. Let me look for the questions. Hang on one second. Uh, everybody's saying hi, hello. Um, you need a haircut. <laughs> hey, John. Hey, good news. I am getting a haircut in two weeks, two and a half weeks. Thank goodness. Um, okay, let's see. This is a gift. Uh, okay, but the income still comes back to you from the property management LLC. Yes. So, so Gift was talking about um, earlier when I mentioned if you buy properties within a self-directed IRA, um, you you pay for management in the form of managing the actual property itself, which is outside the LC, uh, outside the, the the IRA. And within the IRA, you're going to pay generally a custodian to manage the that relationship, the custodial relationship. You know, taking care of the property management company, right? Um, now, let's say you own the property management company. Yes, you're getting the proceeds, the income, the, the, um, the management fee income coming back to you personally because you own the LLC that's managing the property for, for an operations basis. So gift is absolutely correct, which is kind of neat. So it's basically what you're saying is, is that a little bit of a loophole? I'd say we can call it that. I'm not an attorney, but the answer is it's a way for you to look at the rules and use the rules to your advantage. Okay. So a very astute gift for recognizing that. Um, yeah, this is Mike. Hey, Mike. Um, hi, Gary. With setting up an LLC for managing the self-directed IRA, did you need any additional credentials to be operating as the, as a manager? Would you, uh, can I plan, look for my qualifications? How does it work? Yeah, so if you, um, so Mike, if you, if you talk to Carl, um, he'll walk you through all of that in, in great detail. Um, I'd say if you have assets, uh, liquid assets in any any other form, any other retirement form, um, there's a way for you to, to transfer those into a self-directed IRA. Okay. Now, as far as um, the, the, the the property manager LLC, I like in my property manager LLC, I'm not the manager. I'm the owner. Somebody else is the manager. Okay. And you know, they've been the manager for, let me say, 14 years or something. So I started them off from scratch as a beginner. So the reality is, is it's not like you've got a, um, there's no like written test, but I would say be prepared to, um, if somebody asks, you know, let them, the property management company should be able to disclose um, 
you know, they're like a, an annual statement. Everybody should have a financial statement on your businesses and they should be able to, to provide that. OK. Um, and in there you can you can mention the management team, the property manager, the who manages the, the maintenance and repairs, who manages of delinquencies, who manages vacancies, um, all, all those things. OK, um, let's see. This is. Was Mike's question. Fast. Hey, Fast. How you doing, buddy? Uh, do you have an attorney to recommend for partnership? Um, uh, you definitely want to get one in your state, FASL, for everybody here, whatever state or province you're in, you want to get an attorney in that state. Um, I'm not sure about Canada, but I know in the states, uh, attorneys are licensed to, pr to practice at the county level. So somebody uh, who's, you know, you know, I'm not sure all the counties up there in New Jersey, but, you know, make sure they can practice in a county where you reside. They have to be licensed in the state, but they get a business license uh, to practice at the, in the counties. OK, um, so in any case, um, uh, I don't have anybody that I can recommend from New Jersey, but I'm willing to bet Carl does. OK, because Carl uh, used to live out there and he still has his, you know, he's huge presence in Philadelphia. He lives now part time in Florida because um, he also decided to trade in a snow shovel for a uh, lounge, lounge chair <laughs> on the beach um, when, he, when he's not working so hard. But um, what I would do, FAFSA, was uh, go to your local investors club. There is a northern New Jersey RIA group. RIA in New Jersey is kind of broken up into multiple groups by, like, subject. And uh, But just go to one of, their, one of their monthly sessions. You can usually go to one for free. And they have a vendor section set up. You can go over there, get the, get the contact information for the attorneys there, but more importantly, during the breaks, Fassel, is meet people there and they say, hey, you know, who, 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 who have you heard people using for setting up LLCs? Also, Fassel, remember Teresa Martin, she's not licensed. I don't think she's licensed in New Jersey. She is licensed in New York. Um, you should have her contact information. Remember, she's the broker uh, for the Manhasset office, Manhasset, Manhasset Market Center, Long Island. You and I met out there, by the way, for dinner one night, uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, she specializes in that. She could definitely give you a pointer. She might not be able to do the work for you because you're in New Jersey, but she can certainly tell you who to use. She's in Rio. She owns the New York City Rio Group. Okay. Uh, let's see. That's Fassel. Uh, gift. Uh, yes, I got the text. Okay, good. Uh, do you have an attorney to recommend for a partnership? Oh, we just went over that. Um, let's see. Barry. Hey, Barry. Uh, no, hey, Barry, no worries. I know you're a little bit late, but um, tomorrow Beverly will send the recording out. Juliet, I like long hair. <laughs> Thanks, Juliet. What's funny is I, uh, you know, it didn't, it wasn't always this long. The only reason it, let, it gets this long, guys, is I just, I travel so much. I mean, I'm getting my hair cut like every three months, and I used to get a cut like every single month. When Juliet first met me, my hair was way shorter than it is now. Um, but yeah, I guess it looks pretty cool when it blows in the wind. I don't know because I can't see it. Okay, uh, Ryan Alley, what type of attorney, business, uh, attorney. Yeah. So Ryan, for attorneys, the way it works is when they, um, when they go to school, right, they get a, uh, a doctor's degree to practice law, but it's not a specialty. In other words, it's not like medicine where people who practice medicine, they go to school and they specialize while they're, while they're going through internship, residency, all that. Attorneys don't specialize till they get out and practice. Okay. So, you can you can Google attorneys in your area, all right? Uh, Tacoma, you know, Seattle, Gig Harbor, Olympia, and and when you and you Google their look at their descriptions and see how they um, specialize, what they specialize in, or you can just Google business attorney. Um, but also, Ryan, same thing as Fastle. <coughs> excuse me. Go ahead and go to your local investors club and do the same thing. You can meet everybody, get recommendations. Always do your due diligence. Get three. Check them all out. Um, they want you to have. They want you to come in for a, a personal appointment, things like that. But nowadays, a lot of them they're they're more tech savvy and their their time is valuable. Like yours, they'll have a phone consult with you, okay? And they maybe give you a questionnaire to fill out. I like the ones who give questionnaires to fill out because it tells me they're paying attention. They're gathering valuable information on me. And then when we have a discussion, it's more meaningful, more effective, and more productive. Okay. Um, let's see, FASOCON, uh, yes, I do have her information. Um, thank you. Oh, you're welcome, FASO. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. 
Um, that was private partnerships. Um, let's see what else I got here. Oh, um, line of credit is another obvious one where you can use to borrow against yourself. Um, now, there's there's two kinds. There's two types of lines of credit. One is equity based. Uh, HELOC, Home Equity Line of Credit, which is based on equity in your own home. And there's another, another one called PLOC, Personal Line of Credit. It's, uh, we used to call them signature loans. It's just based on your credit worthiness and your track record and the fact that you may have a relationship already with the bank. Um, back in the old days, man, we could get some pretty large personal line of, lines of credit. I, I had them. I had a Home Equity Line of Credit, Personal Line of Credit, uh, credit cards out the wazoo, I mean, probably a hundred and something thousand dollars in credit just on credit cards. So I was able to bob and weave and move pretty quickly um, because of all of that. And I, but the thing is, is <coughs> I being coming from a banking background, I was very disciplined. Okay. And what I would tell you is from a banker's perspective, I recognize a lot of people uh, didn't all have the same discipline. So I would measure the leg, the level of, credit that you that you build is uh tempered by your level of discipline okay always keep it for business purposes only i never ever borrow to buy anything like a car or a vacation or a boat i've always paid cash for those things um and um even even houses okay uh but borrowing real estate for investment purposes obviously that's what you want to use it for so in any case home equity line of credit just a few things to point out here the way you know which bank to go to to get a home equity line of credit on your own personal home are the banks who are advertising that type of a product, okay? If they're advertising, come in and get a home equity line of credit, beginning rate is zero or average rate is 2%, and you know, we'll waive the application fee, which means we're waiving typically the appraisal fee. Go to those banks, okay? Now, the banks that are advertising, hey, come and open up a free checking account and uh, we'll give you a toaster. You don't want to go borrow from that bank because they're telling you in their ads that they need to build up their their capital, what's called um, their they need to acquire deposits, okay? Um, because maybe their loan portfolio is too heavily overweighted and they don't have enough deposits to to even make up for their loan loss reserves. Who, who knows? Lots of reasons. But the banks who are advertising lending money, they're well capitalized. They want to lend money because that's how they make money is by loaning pe money to people like us, okay? Um, now, I prefer that you start off with your own personal bank. Wherever you do your banking now, start there. If you're a lucky person who's a member of a credit union, definitely start there, okay? Um, if you're not, just remember this. Community banks historically have been far easier to work with than the big national banks. We do not uh, recommend in this subject here working with the big giant banks. You know, TD Bank or Bank of America, way too big. And I've seen them foul up more things than that to actually have them help things go go well. Community banks, though, are usually much easier to work with. They actually have lower fees. They're more flexible. They're more likely to approve loans based on the, the, the project itself, okay? Um, the big banks are only looking at cash, collateral, credit, and character, okay? The community banks are looking... Also, with like the project, does this project make sense? Make sense. Um, that carries a lot of weight with these community banks. I specifically prefer community banks who are portfolio lenders. Okay, for a number of reasons. Uh, when they when they are a portfolio lender, what that means is they don't sell their mortgages. They keep the mortgages in house. They service them in house. They don't sell their mortgages, which means they don't have to follow all those FHA guidelines if they don't want to, because they're not underwriting the loan with an FHA. With the purpose of reselling the mortgage okay it's not a not intended to be sold on the open market which means they can be more flexible more basically they they can be more creative okay so in any case uh who might be a line of credit and i do recommend a line of credit over a fixed rate and term because a line of credit you can borrow and then pay it back down and borrow and pay it back down okay over and over and over again um now within that framework. I just want to step aside for a second and talk about um, a line of credit that's typically commercial and can be based on a loan for, uh, sorry, a, a rental portfolio that you have. Let's say you own, you know, 50 units, okay? And you've been at it for a while and you've got substantial equity. 
a lot of people would say in the old day, in the old days, you can't get a commercial loan in a, in a second position because they want to be in a first position. And I agree with them. However, if you go up to a commercial lender and you say, look, I want you to see my portfolio. I want to borrow against this portfolio with a line of credit. Would you be willing to do that? You'll have more yeses come from the smaller community banks than you will from the big giant banks. Some bigger commercial lenders are okay with this. I've seen this done before. Um, into the millions and millions of dollars. We're talking tens of millions of dollars. Um, they all, all will always say, well, we'd like to be in a first position, which means they want to basically refinance your whole portfolio, uh, pay off all the old mortgages, and then you only owe them the money. Um, I generally don't like that because those old mortgages I've been amortizing for a lot of years, and so my principal balance is very low, right? And more of my payments are more principal now than, than interest, okay? So if I go refinance all that, that whole amortization has got to start all over again, which means I'm only paying a little bit of principal and a lot of interest, okay? I don't like that. So I'll tell the lender, say, look, this is just what I want to do. I don't have to have the loan, okay? So write this down. Your best negotiating position is to not have to do something, okay? So I just tell them, I don't have to have the loan. I just want to do it because I'm going to grow my portfolio. I will eventually get a new loan, first mortgage, on the new asset once I season it, raise the rents, and improve the property. And I will get that loan with you, Mr. Lender, okay? In that case, that's enough to get them over to the other side of the fence, okay? Um, the beautiful thing is when you operate that way, then you're essentially paying cash for your next property. Um, you raise the value by improving the property, raising the rents. Then you get a brand new first mortgage on that property. Uh, it might take a year to do it, but you do that, but only enough to pay down the line of credit back to zero. So now you've got the asset. You've got you've you've borrowed you've got a brand new first mortgage on that asset, so the bank now has the first position on that asset, and you've paid on your line of credit. The banker could not be happier. And what they often will do is increase the line of credit by the additional equity you just added to the portfolio in your brand new income producing asset. Okay, very strong position for you, very strong position for the lender. All right, that's equity lines of credit based on assets. The other line of credit, personal line of credit. It's just simply based on you, your reputation, your, your credit worthiness, your job history, how long you've been in your house, how you're managing your, your monthly bills, car payments, telephone, gas, electric, whatever, as well as other lines of credit like a credit cards, for example. OK, um, it's just based on your reputation. Same thing. You can borrow and pay it down, borrow, and pay it down. Um, right. That's probably, you know, those are the main ones now. Obviously, you're all thinking, what about a hard money lender? So let's just tell you right now, um, I have done that in the beginning. Didn't like it at all. I mean, everything actually went well. It went according to plan. Um, but I, I realized, I'm like, my gosh, I paid, you know, 15% interest when I was paying 8% elsewhere. This was back in the 90s. Yeah, late, late 90s. Um, paid a lot of points, like 10 points. It was The guy that, that made the most money was the hard money lender, Okay. And it's called hard for a reason. If I had not met my project plan, if I didn't put that property back on the market and sold it um, or refinanced it like I was supposed to on time, they may have given me extended my term on the loan, but charged me points to do that. OK, which cuts more into my equity um, or in some cases they'll just say, no, we don't want to extend it. We had an agreement. We need our money back. We want it. We want it back now. Um, so even if they do extend it, the next time around, they're going to be a lot more firm and they can call in on the call the note in and you either got to sell the property or they're going to come seize your property. It's called hard money for a reason. And when you cut too much into equity like that in cash flow by paying those all those points in the high interest rate, um, it's going to affect your, your investment long term. You, you, you can't get that money back. OK, so this is like an absolute, absolute no other options dead end last resort. Okay. And only on a really spectacular deal. You don't just do this as a regular course of business. Too many times they don't work. People get hurt. Um, you know, it's just, just not good business. So we don't want you to do this. We want you to use the other methods. Okay. Uh, borrowing against yourself. Um, any case, uh, let's do this. I want to stop now and check for questions before we wrap things up. So let's see, what do we have here? Um, Let's go back. I, by the way, I know I know I just ruffled some feathers here. I apologize, but that's just based on um, 
years of experience, not just my own, but working with people. I mean, I mean, thousands and thousands of students and clients. Okay, um, this is from Michelle Lane. Uh, let's see, Michelle Lane. Okay, Gary, did you see my email I sent yesterday about an investor client um, who I believe has to cart before the horse? She wants to flip house but has no. Uh, Hey, Michelle, I don't think I saw that. Um, has no income, no savings to speak of, no job, no family, partners, et cetera. Doubtful that any institution would loan her money. She wants to look at foreclosure to buy and move into, but doesn't even have her house list to get advice. Yeah. Um, I would, Michelle, before you ever spend any more time with her, it sounds like you've already interviewed her. Tell her one of the requirements is that she's got to get pre-qualified. And that, you can send her to a little small local community bank and see if she can get pre-qualified, okay? And if she does, then then you can work with her. Um, if not, I you don't want to spend time with folks like that, Michelle. I mean, it's just going to be a time waster, okay? Uh, even a hard money lenders won't lend her money. From what you just told me there, she's not going to get anybody to lend her money, okay? Um, no job, no anything. Now, if she has a house, that's something she can leverage. So, obviously, she can sell it. Um, she may be also to be able to bring in a, a private lender. Uh, so remember, use the private lender report, Michelle, in your area. Just go to My Investment Services, click on private lender report. You can look at by zip code, I think, or county or whatever. Um, see who the private lenders are in the area and hook her up with uh, one of those guys and see if they will look at her situation. And they might give her money, but they're going to want to be um, attach a lien on the property to do that. Okay. And it sounds like to me she's going to have to sell that property, and then you have something to work with. That that would be my advice there. But resend it, resend the email. I uh, did send it to Gary at myinvestedservices.com. Um, I'm not sure. I, I'm normally pretty good. I mean, sometimes things fall through the cracks. So go ahead and resend it, and if you know, use Gary at myinvestedservices.com. Thanks for the question too, by the way, Michelle. Okay, Gary. Uh, this is Mike. Uh, hey, Mike. Mike is asking. Hey, Gary, what about smaller investors for a personal line of credit? Uh, would you recommend this type of line of credit to buy an investor property? Um, yeah, if you, you know, if you go to a private lender, Mike, for a personal line of credit, I think that's what you're asking for. Um, smaller credit, your yeah, personal line of credit. They're just going to charge you a lot more than a, than a, a, a local community bank will. Okay. Um, generally going to pay a higher rate and some points and things like that, but check it out. So do the private lender report in your area, Mike, um, same thing, my investment services, members checks in silver level and grab that report for yourself. Okay. And, and reach out to them. You get a uh, name and address, I believe. So send them, by the way, guys, whenever you contact private lenders, you don't just want to just send them something in the mail and say, Hey, I'd like to work with you. Show them an example of what you've done. Okay. And if you haven't done any investments and you're an agent working with investors, let them know that you work with investors and you got a number of investors who you believe could use your services and give them some examples. Somebody's looking for a flip, somebody's looking for a rental, and get specific size, fourplex for 250, something like that. That's how you get them to respond to you. If you're looking for yourself personally, um, you want to show them your what you've done. Give them some examples before and after pictures and what you made on your last flip, for example. Or in the case of a rental property, you know, um, a pro forma on the showing the performance of the property that will get their attention. They will then ask you for more information at that point. Okay, so just want to get you prepared to, to contact those guys. Um, okay, gift. Uh, do you have time for one more question? Yes, gift. Go ahead and uh, hit me up. Um, never mind. Oh, I probably just answered it. <laughs> um, okay, guys, that's actually the end of the questions. Um, I'll I'll reach out to Tim and see if we can reschedule for him. Um, I'm not sure because I think I've got somebody already lined up for June, but I'll reach out to Tim and get back to you guys. He's an awesome dude. Man, tons of investment experience and broker's experience. I mean, the guy was a complete rock star. He's part of a, in my mastermind group. He's one of the six founders of the group, and he's part of an initial group of three that we call the Three Amigos, right? They've known each other since the early, since, well, the 90s, early 90s. Um, and all three of them, absolute barnstormers, okay? 
And uh, so Tim's agreed to share with us his wisdom, and he's going to show that. We'll just have to figure out the makeup date and time. In any case, guys, I hope you have a great night and a great rest of the week, and I will see you next week, uh, Monday night the 14th. I will be in Charlotte, actually right where I am right now, in fact. So see you next Monday night. In the meantime, have a great rest of the week and weekend. God bless you and your families. And again, I appreciate your participation, giving me the opportunity uh, to help and serve you and guide you guys through this, uh, this maze of investing and working with investors. So take care. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.